Miari kena usakasakabo, hola y buenos dia, hello and good day. It's Elba again, aka Phoenix Taino, playing some more wakfu. Welcome back. This is day two of playing wakfu on the Ogress server with uh, my Eniripsa character that I have lovingly named Nikiwari. If you guys want to see me playing as any of my other characters, my main is a Sadida named Watu Yanani. And my other three alternate characters, cartoons, or as older Wafu players refer to them, quote unquote, tunes, they, um, they are a Uganak named Katirahu, a Sram named Ebunaru, and an Osamodas named Buritina. Those are all the characters I have so far. And I literally decided on an Eniripsa because on the Rubalak server, I have a character of every class. So yes, a total of 18 characters, and every single one of them has a Daino name. Which makes me, like, happier than it probably should. Alright, my inner child is healing, okay? We're not going to judge me. Um, or, I mean, you can judge me if you want to. Um, I just don't need to hear about it. I don't need to know. Anyway, um... <laughs> So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick back up where I left off, which is after having left the Celestial Island of Ri. Um, it's got me still here, though, so we're going to use the Zap because the next quest is the Mercenary Training, and they want us to head to the Mercenary's Training Room. First, we're going to go to the Temple of Scriptures, though. This is something that you're going to want to do first before anything else, anytime you... Excuse me, I had a, a hiccup. Um, but yeah, anytime you go to play the game, before you do anything else, you want to pray at the Temple of Scripture because um, the Fifty Shades of Almanax is one of those quests that isn't going to be completed. Um... That you can't you can't really finish it in in one foul swoop, right? Fifty Shades of Almanac is pray at the Almanac's altar fifty times, and you can only do it once a day. So you have to log in and remember to pray at the Almanac's altar every day for fifty days. So when you do click on the Almanac's altar, which is like a sundial in the middle um, of the room, the pop-up will say, a smooth, rich voice resounds, and then you just click the Pray to the Meridia of the Day. Click on that button, and boom, you know you've succeeded because this little pop-up above your health bar and everything will show up that says Swart Success. And um, I don't know why... But the quest itself, when you open up your quest log by pressing Q or, um, honestly, quest management. Here we go. This little book button, right? So you can go to your quest book and see the almanacs, achievements, all that other stuff on the little bar that pops up. But we want to go here to the actual quest book. It'll open this up and I believe one of these on the side because there's different quests that have uh that will be in different categories right so generally speaking uh the quests that you will be doing will be in this world category right 
you may have a mercenary post type quest that will show up in this tab anything related to Mount Zinnit like this mercenary training one it's going to show up here I'm not sure what else would show up here to be honest unless it's like the daily quest which I'm not sure if there's if it's blank because I already completed it or what and then heritage I've yet to see a quest here um that's probably because I'm still the newish player This is Jenry Hones Sr. with the blue hair and glasses over here in the Temple of Scriptures slash library. Let's go ahead and talk to him. Hmm, what is it for? I'm very busy. Research waits for no man. I need some information. How can I help you? What does being an archaeosologist involve? We archaeosologists are members of Automized Disciples. We're scholars, as you might know, and we're especially interested in uncovering relics from times gone by. Thanks for the info. And then he asks again, how can I help you? Nothing right now. I believe there was another option, though. Hold on. We're going to go back. Um, kid, aren't you a little young to be watching over all these books all by yourself? Grunts, yet another who hasn't done their research on the important people of Astrup. Don't imagine I've always had this prepubescent four-eyed face. For your information, you should know that I spent my youth running across the world with my friend Pappy Pal. If my son was here, he'd make fun of you, and probably of me too. Youngin? Pappy Pal? Son? Unfortunately, yes. A few years ago, I learned of a most wonderful and legendary object, the Holy, the Holy Liarg, which is said to give eternal life. Since I didn't want it to fall into the wrong hands, like that foul Brachmari in Lavoc, I set out to find it. That's interesting, but it doesn't really explain... Don't interrupt me, kid. One thing led to another, and eventually I left with some hooded strangers and the vicious Lavoc. My son, Jenry Hones Jr., ran to my rescue. I was mortally wounded during the adventure. Jr. used the Holy the Arg on me to save my life. Whoa! And, well, it did save my skin, but regaining my physical youth was an unexpected side effect. When they saw that, the Hooded Ones lost all interest in the Holy Relic, and Lavak ran away as he always does when he faces us Hans. What a coward. That said, I'm not one to complain. A second breath of life to study even more mysteries? What a joy! That's crazy. I have a better understanding now. I'm sorry I doubted you. Throughout the game, you'll see that the main character, your characters, um, text, speech, you know, their lines are very much like young, naive, but still like confident, but not necessarily deservedly so. So kind of cocky, you know, um, which, I, which I find interesting. But then again, you know, this game is very much an adventure game, so it makes sense for the main character to be really, like, gung-ho and ready to fight and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Anyway, now we're going to go to Astrub because we need to head to the mercenaries training room. And uh, we can now, at the top right indicated is 50 shades of almanacs pray at the almanacs ultra 50 times and right next to it is the number one because we just prayed so you can keep track of how many days you have left that way or by opening your quest book to head to pappy pal from the astrub zap you're going to go right it'll take you to where the Astrub Center Drago Turkey Express is, and then you can just go down to the right a little bit. And boom, Pappy Pal, Astrub City, Pal House Courtyard. That's how you know you're in the right place. 
He's the guy, the elderly gentleman with an umbrella and a bunch of coins around him. Just for a visual reference. Um, and let me open up my map because that can be helpful as well. When it comes to the map, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Like if I press this territories flag, it's going to highlight anything that's marked as either neutral, um, Suffolkian territory, Brachmarian territory, Banta uh, or Bantian territory or Amakman territory. And on the bottom left, it shows which color is assigned to which of the nations. And we can always uncheck things that we're not really looking for to make life a little bit easier. You can literally uncheck everything except for point of interest, right? If you're looking for where you need to go next, you need the point of interest icon um, selected. And that exclamation point is where you need to go. These are also points of interest. Quest uh, will take you to these areas. But this specific point of interest that you need to go to right now is usually indicated with either an exclamation point or this, this uh, what looks like an arrow or a dreidel, um, that icon. So you want to look for an exclamation point or this, you know, um, 3D arrow slash dreidel looking icon. So to head to the mercenaries training room, it's literally across the street from Pappy Pal's house. So we would just go down to the left a little bit. This building here with what look like armored dummies on the outside, a health kit, and some other stuff. This is the mercenaries training room. And when you hover your mouse over the door, it's going to say mercenary training room. So you know exactly which building it is. And we will right click on things that we want to select. And little pop up buttons will show for indicating a hand. The word enter. So you know to enter. I know some of this stuff may seem intuitive to the majority of you, but you know, I'm trying to make this as, I'm trying to break it down as simply as possible. You know what I mean? Just in case somebody may not be familiar with computers in general, but I digress. For this quest, it says train on a mannequin. You can either fight the mannequin and then talk to the Astro of Night or talk to the Astro of Night, fight the mannequin and then talk to him again. So I'm going to go ahead and talk to him just so we can see all of the text and I can read it out loud for anybody who, um, you know, just for accessibility reasons, right? Here we go. <laughs> hey, are you new? Go on, train on the dummy in front of you. Let's see what you can do. The button says look carefully and then to initiate a fight we want to right click and the sword icon is the one that you use to initiate a fight so we click on that and we want to use the left button on the mouse to actually select things right the right click will open up menus and whatnot let you see what the options are with regard to interacting with the particular um, person place or thing and the left click is how you would actually select things so the placement phase for those who may not remember is you know just a couple of seconds it gives you to select where on the battlefield you want your player to start so if you are a close range melee player and want to start a little bit closer then you would select the blue square closest to your target. If you're a more defensive player, then you might want to start further back. Or if your attacks happen to be distance attacks. Then we click on the swords down here to actually initiate the fight whenever we're ready or just let the time run out. So um, these are all the spells. Just a quick refresher that my character can do. Here would be a weapon. But it's blank right now because I don't have a weapon. I can just punch with the fist or use any of these spells here. Um, I'm just going to use the first row of spells. These are the 
basics right to see what your target is weakest to you can right click and then a window will pop up showing you all of their stats so this thing doesn't have any strengths or any specific weaknesses so we might as well just hit it with whatever we got a fire attack this one shows that it has three a three square range and I can attack anywhere on these blue squares right so if an enemy is on these blue squares I could hit them and I can hit multiple enemies right because this is showing three red squares um, indicating that any enemy on any of those squares is going to get attacked not just the one in front we can't see that right now because there's only one target but I'm just explaining things so that when we're in a more um, time sensitive battle some of this stuff has already kind of been explained you know what I mean um, this right here shows whether or not you win right it says victory and it's in yellow if you lose it's gonna say defeat and be grayed out it'll say how many turns it took for you to win the total amount of time in the fight and um, how many commas you would have won all the way to the right in the middle is any experience the darker tealish color um, that's how much experience you currently have the lighter teal or aqua color is how many experience you gained from this particular fight it shows your character at the bottom the character that you were fighting and you would be able to see any allies that were fighting with you in this drop down so with the arrow not selected it's just your character stats and all that stuff and you click on the arrow and it'll show who you fought how many you know how many um enemies there were how many allies what your allies level and experience how many commas they won any materials or resources that would have been dropped um that were given to your character would also show up on this bar and let's say you were moving too quick and you accidentally close it out and you're like darn it right so first you go to your chat over here on the right is when you hover over the little squares it's going to show you what each color represents right you want to make sure the green is selected that's your game log so then you go down and it says this fight is over click here to reopen the end of fight screen so you just click and boom that same thing that you accidentally X'd out of too quickly pops right back up for you. Moving along. Now it says speak to the Astra of Night. So if I left here and started wandering around and was like, oh man, I don't know what I need to do. Then I would just go to the top left of my screen, um, you know, open up my quest list what is what I have um, actively what I'm actively tracking I'm gonna go ahead and when you click on the eye it makes it stop tracking you can open your quest book again by you know going down here to quest management and clicking on the quest book or simply pressing Q and you can go to your quests anything that's to do that's left to do is um, here you can see all of them you can see the ones you finish just if you need a reminder of anything but yeah so you can monitor and stop monitoring a quest and it'll just it will no longer be on this drop down on the left and the short uh, we can call it like a quest shortcut um, but yeah so we have and you can even click on it and it'll give you more specifics like what you can win the reward for that quest the requirements how many tasks in the quest you've um, accomplished so far and all of that fun stuff so we can click on this compass on the top left and it shows hey you were supposed to be here so we know hey I shouldn't have left the room I need to go back now sometimes just pro tip sometimes when you complete a quest the compass stays on and there's no way to turn the compass off unless you have another quest requiring the compass 
So I generally, before I um, go to the next step, will turn the compass off just so I don't have to worry about the compass arrow or whatever being annoying and in the way when I no longer have a quest activated. You know what I mean? So that's something that you can opt into or out of however you see fit. Um, but I like to provide as much information as possible so that whatever decisions you guys make are informed decisions. So we need to talk to the Astrop Knight to complete a Valiant Knight quest. Looks like that's the only task left. So let's talk to him. Not bad at all. The old timer has skill when searching for new mercenary recruits. You might only be a beginner and you're no match for me, but you'll make fast progress. Just you wait. I hope so. In fact, if you're up for it, I might have a mission for you. Yes, I'm interested. The old guy gave me two. Let me have a look. Oh yeah, the first mission is great. It's right up my street. Wow, and the reward is insanely good. Let's see the second mission. Hmm, that one is good for you. Here, you can have it. What? Rats? <laughs> Don't thank me. You know, one of the mercenary rules states that the easiest mission should be given to beginners, even if the reward isn't great. It's good training to help them progress. The strongest mercenary gets the best mission. But don't worry, one day you'll get to my level. Rats? Really? And now the Valiant Knight quest has been completed. Ta-da! After having completed a Valiant Knight, the next quest that shows up is Second Choice Mission. And for this mission, all we got to do is locate the Astrub Center Drago Express, which we've done before. And I want to point something out real quick before I move on. So the compass for the second choice mix mission is automatically activated, right? We can deactivate it by clicking on this little compass icon on the um, quest shortcut. So usually it's on the top left of the screen unless you move it but when we select it right it shows us exactly where we need to go if we go into the mercenary training room note that the compass icon is gone now why is that because we are not in the area where the final location of the quest is you know that designated little square right because there's all these squares you know if you consider this game like a giant chessboard um a very well designed giant chessboard um the square that indicates or will activate the next step in the quest is not in this area therefore the compass won't be available for me to select so you know you're in the right area when the cup compass option shows up. So now I know, like, wherever the Astro Center Drago Express is, is in the area I am now also in, right? So if we follow the compass, it's going to take us to the Drago Express that we've already activated with prior characters. So nothing special, I think, is going to happen. Or maybe it will. I don't know. Let's find out. So right click again, uh, right click is to interact with things, left click is to actually select whatever option you're being given when, after you've interacted with, <clears throat> after you've interacted, excuse me, with a person, place, or thing. So normally when you're activating something or, or um, you know, gaining any kind of experience because of an action, uh, there will be like a little a little sound and you'll see like an aura around your character. Um, that's one way to, you know, audibly and or visually tell like, OK, you've completed that step. Uh, you may or may not have heard the little through, but that also indicates that that task has been completed and the next task is available to you. Uh, you may or may not be able to see 
without leaving this map what the next next task is but that's just head to the Astrup sawmill cellar um, I'm gonna go ahead and run there but if you happen to have started the game and run around and activated all the Drago turkeys in the area which I highly recommend doing um, then you can just travel to this Drago Turkey here, the Forest Drago Express, because this building right here is the Sawmill Cellar. It's literally, they're right next to each other. But we're going to run all the way over there just so you have an idea of where to go. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm also going to make sure to keep the compass activated because I know that that's um, a good visual way to see, like, what direction I'm going in or you need to go in or what have you so um, yeah if you haven't activated any other Drago turkeys they will be grayed out the active ones are red as you can see or maybe you can't but I'm telling you that um, all the Drago turkeys in Astrup are red because I've activated them all Another thing you can do whenever you're in an area and you know you're going to be playing in that area a lot is to tap on the Phoenix statue in that area. Right click and press the heart. It says link, your, link yourself to the Phoenix. So what this means is that no matter where I am in the game, if I die, I'm going to, re to, to be resurrected here at this Phoenix. And when you go to your map, which a shortcut is to press the M button, uh, you can click on the Phoenix icon and it will show you where on the map your Phoenix, or the Phoenix rather, is. So you know where to go. To get to the map without using the shortcut, right? You would just click on this compass icon right here and it says show the map and then in parentheses it says m reminding you that m is the shortcut and then boom see because this phoenix is activated it will be um it will be colored in i believe it stays gray when it's not when you're not when your character isn't linked to it so from the Astrob Drago Express, the Phoenix is literally right here. I just wanted to remind you guys. And we're going to go to the Forest Drago. Well, to the Astrob Sawmill Cellar. And eventually, we're going to activate the Forest Drago Express. That is a cool looking mount. On the top left, we now see a new objective. It says competitive. It's got a hand that's glowing, right? These are area quests that are generally timed. And you may or may not have noticed that it went from, that it just changed because we are now in a new area. So if I would have stayed going straight, we've got Ancestor Maui. He is a Sedita, and he is one of the clan members. Every area has a clan member that's kind of watching over that area. And just as a quick refresher, these buttons down here let us know what's going on with this area in particular. So the stamp around the clan member is red, indicating that something is out of balance, right? We can see what is out of balance. Hold on, let me move away from where that tree is. It says Wakfu. W so we can press the W keyboard or click on that button and it shows us what is required for this area to be in balance right so this area wants between 100 and 150 trees and 200 to 300 tree knees so these uh, monsters in the area so we have plenty of tree knees this is fine but we need more trees there's not enough trees that's why this stamp on the top right with Ancestor of Maui's face on it has a red border. 
when things are um, when there's too much wakfu in an area it will be green when there's not enough wakfu or too much stasis it will be red one thing that the game did not teach me is that certain trees and certain plants can only be planted in certain areas so in this particular area in the forest of Astra, you can only plant chestnut and hazel trees and you can find out what you can and can't plant by pressing the information button i believe no the sun button that's the weather the shortcut for that is an x and again if you hover over these buttons if there's a shortcut it will be in parentheses next to the title of whatever that button is right so we know we can press x and boom the weather um window is now open we can see that this area has hazel and chestnut trees like i mentioned and we can also grow wild mint here Basically, this is good to know so that you know exactly what resources you can um, grow and, you know, collect seeds from and harvest here. And it also lets you know, like, hey, what you can't grow here. So if you're trying to grow a particular plant or tree, like an ash tree, for example, it's not going to grow here. Right. It's not, it's not anything you're doing wrong. You're just in the wrong area. With regard to trees, trees can only be planted in specific squares and those squares look different than other squares so let me show you an example we have three buttons whenever we right click on a tree you can prune the tree which gives you a chestnut cutting the cuttings are what you use to grow more trees this basket here is to gather if the tree has any kind of nut or fruit or whatever on it once it's fully grown this gather button will be available. Otherwise, it won't be. And then we have the ax button. That's how we cut down the tree. This is how we get the actual wood, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and gather because it's like, it's a long process to get to where, to where there's actually a some, some nut or fruit or something growing off of the tree. And now we see just two buttons whenever we right click the game is only giving us the option to prune or to chop the tree down so at this stage if I prune I can prune twice getting a minimum of two cuttings and that will allow me to plant right but I won't be able to cut the tree down because it will make the tree smaller again and that will it, it will be like in a seedling form and I'll have to wait for the tree to grow When it comes to the axe, this will completely chop down the tree and get rid of it, making the square that it's on available for more trees to be grown on it. So I'm going to just prune it and get the cuttings. You're going to see, um, or I'm going to at least describe, if you can't see, now the tree is smaller. That lets us know that it was, in fact, pruned. It is no longer big enough to be chopped down. So when I right click on it, we'll see that the only option is to prune it again. Now we have a baby tree, a little seedling. And when you right click on it, it just gives you the option to trample this particular resource. And that would just get rid of it and allow um, for growth on the square that this particular tree is growing on and the reason to trample something um, would be if you wanted to grow something else on top of that or if you wanted to restart the timer because what ends up happening is once you plant something in the game there is a specific amount of time I can't remember if it's five minutes or longer than that but there's, there's a specific amount of time where other people can't come and harvest from a resource that you just got done planting so that you have time to gather whatever resource from the seed that you have, right? After so much time, anybody can do whatever they want 
to the tree after it's grown. Um, but it gives you, the game basically gives you first dibs on whatever you grow. Um, and it keeps you away from gathering from other people's stuff if they're literally just planting it and trying to gather, you know, a clipping, or, or rather a cutting, or wood, or a fruit, or whatever the case may be. So it kind of like protects. Um, and so you would trample in this case if you want to be able to plant a tree on top of there that nobody else can have access to, at least for the first couple of minutes. So now, if you notice, whenever I click on the cutting, which if you don't see anything in your shortcuts automatically when you, um, you know, select the cutting option on a tree, you can open your inventory, which is this bag icon or as uh, is indicated on the screen, you can just press the I on your keyboard. That'll open up your inventory and anything that you your character has equipped will appear here. So you can actually move things out of your shortcuts by, you know, clicking on it with the left click button and then just pulling it away uh, while you still have the button clicked down. And um, you can just, from your inventory, drag and drop. You would click on the item, hold the button, drop it to where to the area you want it, let go of the button, and then boom, you now have a shortcut to the chestnut cutting in your little shortcuts bar here, where your spell where your spells would normally appear whenever you're um, in the middle of a battle. But uh, what we're gonna do is note now that whenever I have the cutting selected and move around the area, it's grayed out, but oh, that was yellow, and this was yellow, and this is yellow, and this is yellow. You may or may not notice that these squares look a little different than the other squares in the area. That's how you know you can put a tree here. And pay attention to the game log, because when I initially tried to plant something, it wouldn't let me. It said, fight in progress, please try again later. And that's because this character was fighting um, within a close enough proximity to where I wanted to plant, where it was like, and it was interfering with the, with the game, right? So it wouldn't let me. So it says, you have just used chestnut cutting. You have lost one chestnut cutting, right? Sometimes... You plant something and nothing happens. That's because that particular item only has a certain percentage, a certain success percentage, meaning that let's say I were to click on an item. It's not going to let me right now because I don't have a box. Here we go. Let me go to not a box, a square. Same difference. But see, whenever you hover over an area where you can actually plant whatever it is you have selected, it's going to say 56%. That means this has a 56% chance of actually growing. Let's see if a tree will grow here. So it says in the gamer log, you have lost one chestnut cutting. So my professions are pretty high, meaning that this is probably gonna grow every time. But if it doesn't grow for you, it's not something that you're doing wrong. It's just that you don't have enough experience with regard to the specific profession. So in this case, when we're planting trees, that's associated with the lumberjack profession. And you can see your professions by going down to the bottom and pressing J for job. Okay. Um, and it's this little hammer with a bunch of other things around it. Click on that and it shows... Your professions, I have it sorted by level, which is why it's like this. But um, yeah, all of the professions and your level for each profession. To, to start a profession, there's different uh, characters in the game that you would just talk to. And they would indicate like, oh, I'm a chef, you know, da 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 da. And then eventually the text window will give you an option to like learn that profession. And then you would just do, you know, create an item or, or, you know, for the trapper profession, for example, all you have to do to level up 
is right click on a monster and harvest from it. You know, for the herbalist profession, you would right click on a plant and harvest from it and that would give you experience for the herbalist profession. And you would also see like how many experience you gained for that action and how many experience you have left to level up. That's in the gamer log, but because these, um, because my profession is so high with the trapper that these lower level characters don't even give any experience to me anymore. So that's, that's why that no work when it comes to showing on the, um, on the, in the chat, the action that I just took. This voiceover is because I forgot to mention that whenever you hover over a particular monster or herb or whatever it is that you are wanting to, um, whichever resource it is that you're trying to interact with, you can see what profession is associated with that resource in the little pop-up window. And there will even be a level next to it that lets you know what the minimum level for that profession needs to be for you to be able to actually harvest from that particular um, plant or get anything off of that particular monster. But let's go back to where we were before so that you guys can see where to go next, right? So... Again, we're back at the Ancestor Maui area. We ran straight from this road up to get to him. And then to get to the Astrub Sawmill Cellar, we're going to go to the left. And when we click on the compass, it's confirming that, yes, that's the direction we need to go. We are going to go here, follow the compass. And it's pointing, you can see the arrow move as I move away, depending on my location from where I need to go, the compass is going to be like, hey, no, it's over here. Wait, now it's over here. Okay, so I can, I know that this is where I got to go. If you didn't have the compass on and you knew to go to the forest area, you may not know to click on this unless you had the compass selected because that literally tells you like, you got to go here. This is where you go. And when I hover over it, oh, sawmill cellar, we're going to right click and it gives us the option to go down. You may or may not have noticed a red trophy with the crack on it appearing above my head every now and then. What that means is that you are in an area where there was a mini quest, one of those timed things that I was mentioning earlier, and you didn't complete it. So you didn't win any rewards for that available quest. That's all that means. It doesn't mean you did anything horrible or that anything bad is happening to you. It's just you didn't complete the mini quest for this area at the time. That's it. That's all. So we're going to right click on these Astrubian rats because if we look at the second choice mission quest down here at the bottom after going into the Astrub sawmill cellar you have to defeat the rats so this game does a pretty decent job of telling you what to do next you just need to know where to look the game doesn't always do a good job of telling you everything you need to know like it gives you the basics and then it's like have fun figuring out the rest you know so that's why I'm doing this walkthrough, because I would have very much appreciated videos like this existing in the same year that I'm playing. Because, sure, there are older videos, but there have been updates since then. Things are a little bit different. So, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and start the fight before the time runs out. To do so, as just a quick reminder, we're going to click on these two crossed swords ready to fight and it's reminding us that the space bar is what we need to press so here we go the fight has begun and now it's telling me it's my turn so you want to remember that attacking from the side or from behind is ideal it does more damage it's something like 
10% from the side, 25% from the back, if I recall correctly. So yeah, it's, it's worth it. Now we can click through here. It shows the blue squares that gives me my range. And see, normally I would be able to attack here, but because these rats are in the way, it's messing with my line of sight, which is something that Arena, whenever you are still on the Celestial Island of Re, one of the quests, one of the tasks for um, the, after you talk to Arena, is a line of sight quest, and that's what it's ex trying to explain. Um, it doesn't do a very good job of explaining it, though. When I first started playing, I was very much confusion. So, I was like, why is this not working? There's nothing in my way. It doesn't matter if the character is in your way. It matters if the character is blocking your quote-unquote line of sight. It doesn't have to be your literal line of sight, which my neurodivergent ass 100% was, took it literally. <laughs> I was like, wait, there's nothing blocking my character. There's nothing in between my character and the target. Why is it saying I don't have a line of sight? It was a very confusing time. Eventually I figured it out, but I was like, it would have been nice if this was better ex explained. Like instead of like a tutorial when it pops up and there's this little tutorial that you got to read through. If there was like a mini video or something in there to be like, oh, okay, you know, help those of us that are visual learners, you know, or who can, who would literally overanalyze things. So you can say one statement, but if it can be interpreted more than one way, I'm thinking about each interpretation and trying to figure out which one is the one you specifically meant. Yeah. Yeah. So, this uh, end of fight screen is showing that we gained so much experience from this quest. We are almost leveled up to 14, it looks like. And we fought three Astrobian rats. Didn't get any money, though. And it took us four turns to do so, which uh, totaled three minutes and 12 seconds. Again... Just as a reminder, because repetition helps, at least it helps me when I'm learning. So I'm uh, I'm incorporating that into my little tutorials, my little walkthrough videos or whatever. But um, yes, you would click on the game log. You go to your chat. Make sure the green square is selected. Otherwise, you won't see it. But then you would go to where it says the fight is over. Click here to reopen the end of fight screen. It's underlined as well, indicating that it is, in fact, a link. And you can open back this uh, victory end of fight screen thingy if you closed it before you, before you got all the information you needed from it. Another voiceover because it occurred to me that I neglected to mention that if you're not sure how to leave an area, nine times out of ten, all you have to do is is tap on the blue glowy spot on the ground somewhere and that will be how you exit. And again, just as a reminder, I know this may be annoyingly repetitive, but I'm just trying to be as thorough and helpful as possible. You will not see the compass icon if you are not in the same area as the last point in a given task. So when I go back into the old sawmill cellar, we go to business pal and there's no compass icon next to locate the forest Drago express. Cause I'm not in the forest. Technically I'm in the sawmill cellar. When I come out Astrub forest, I'm officially in the forest, which is where the Drago express is. So I can see a compass. And as mentioned earlier, the Drago Express is literally right here next to the sawmill cellar. So we're going to click on it. It's going to take us to Pappy Pal. Well, it's going to take us to a map that we can then go to the Astrob Center Drago Express. That is the one closest to Pappy's Pal's house, which is this little area right here. So we're going to click on that Drago Express. 
and now the compass shows up next to Pappy Pal, next to the Speak to Pappy Pal task, rather, because we are in Astrob City, where Pappy Pal also is. Now we're here, we can speak to Pappy Pal. Rats in the old sawmill cellar, well, the Astro Knight wasn't very generous when handing out missions. A mercenary must always value a beginner. It's one of the guild's tenets. But know that all missions are worth taking, and you did improve your training. I would have rather had the Astro Knight's mission. I've sent him on a rather risky mission, but he's already proven his worth and has many exploits to his name despite his young age. You're still missing a lot of training before you can head out on a more important mission. As long as I don't have to fight any more rats. Here, this is your reward from the previous mission. Now head to the Mercenaries Reserve to the northeast of Astrup. You'll find some mercenary equipment. We'll call it a welcome gift. Come see me again when you're geared up, and I'll tell you the rest. I'm off right away. And business pal officially complete. And just to help with the transition into the next clip, that's going to just be a breakdown of different things that that you can do. Not necessarily a walkthrough itself. It's just going to be a lot of me talking and explaining characteristics and um, stuff like that with regard to your player. Anyway, as mentioned previously... Whenever you go to the chat, you can see any experience that has been gained, any actions and what their effects are, or if there was no effect, all that stuff will be in the game log. You want to make sure you have this green button selected. And um, in the game log, it reads, you have completed the quest business, pal. You have picked up one mercenary bag. The quest hero potential has started. Nikiwari plus 462 XP points. XP is experience plus one level. Next level in 16,534 points. To see our stats and all that fun stuff, what you would do is go down to your, you know, little game bar where your spells and your resources and whatnot are. And you would select the first icon on the left, characteristics. And the shortcut for that is P, which is why the profession shortcut is J for jobs, not P for profession. Because P is the shortcut for your characteristics. Um, and to remember it, a little bit more easily, I would just say P for personal, right? Your personal stats and everything for your character or P for player. That's even better. P for player and then J for job to kind of keep things to help you remember the shortcut. So we click on characteristics or we press P, right? And we have our player info. It may show up like this, right? The mini window. If you want the full breakdown, then you would press all the way to the bottom on the left, this arrow button. Press that and it shows you your full breakdown. Shows that we are now, if you look at the top, underneath the character's name, level 14. And you can drop down to modify your level and do different builds. That's something that will be explained later because it's not really applicable at this point. Um, it probably, yeah, it won't be until we get to like level 25, 20 or 25, maybe 20. Anyway, so on the bottom right, the display abilities button is glowing. It's glowing because whenever you level up, you get more points and you can use those points to boost your um, characteristics. So when we click on display abilities, we get our characteristics sheet or characteristics page. And you can see the points to distribute on the top right. Next to where it says points to distribute is 
um, a button that when you hover over it, it says open the list of pages. And we can see the builds, the different build options. So we only have the real level build. I'm going to go ahead and modify it just to show you guys what it looks like. So you could select from the options, the different levels. Like once you get to level 100, it's going to give you different build options because different dungeons um, will have like there may be a quest that's like complete. Complete this dungeon at level 35, no higher than level 35. But if you're a level 100, you're kind of SOL unless you level down using an established build, right? So I'm going to rename this one real level. We're going to capitalize it and make sure we spell things correctly. And then you would just hit confirm. Now we have our real level. And if you wanted to create a new build, you would hit the create a page button. But that's going into things we can't really do yet. So there's no point in explaining further. We'll circle back to this. We'll circle back. Um, but with points to distribute, we have these different sections on the left. Intelligence, strength, agility, fortune, and major. Which, uh, next activation at level 25. It tells you when the next, when you're, when you're set to get more points for that particular section. But right now, we have four points to distribute for intelligence. Three to distribute for strength to distribute for agility three for fortune and none for major and you would just look at every section and decide what is best i haven't i still don't fully understand what each thing does it does explain it to you in a pop-up and if you want to be able to keep um the information you can normally right click and it'll keep it but it might be for fighting yeah, it might be when you're fighting only just because in the middle of a fight, there's, you know, there's a clock running. Um, but yeah, health points, it shows here whenever you hover over percentage health points, it'll be 0% health points. If you add one of the points that you have to distribute over, then you get 4% health points, right? So to add a little bit extra to this explanation, when it comes to percent health points, let's say you have 1,000 health points. When you add one point to the percent health points, that'll increase your health points by 4%, meaning that you will then have your base 1,000 health points plus 40 health points, giving you a total of 1,040 health points. Hopefully that makes sense. And then when we go to elemental resistance, it says resistance to all elemental damage, current level zero. If I put a point here, it's going to increase my elemental resistance to 10. Um, and again, as I mentioned, each thing is a breakdown. This barrier thing is barrier of 50%, which means minus seven damage received um, right now, zero times per turn, but if I were to distribute a point here, you would have a barrier of 50% of your level, which is minus seven damage received one times per turn. So what that means is if a character, an enemy goes to hit me, and that hit, that attack would normally take away 50 health points, then... When I increase my barrier, that same character with the same attack is now only doing 43 damage to me. I'm only losing 43 health points every time they hit me instead of the full 50. When we do percent heal received, 0% heals received for an ally. That's what that uh, green button, that green character, person, doll looking thing is. And the next level is 6% heals received. So what that means is if an ally is healing me and their spell gives 100 HP, I would get the 100, in, the 100 HP plus 
of that 100, meaning that I would get a total of 106 HP every time they heal me. Keep in mind, though, that this is reduced by half or 50% if you're healing yourself. So if my spell also gave 100 HP, but I'm doing it on myself, then I would only get 50 HP. 6% of that is 3, giving me a total of 53%, not 53%, 53 HP whenever I go to heal myself after I upgrade that particular section. And then percent armor health points is another way of increasing your HP in armor specifically. So armor would be the things that you are wearing. Right now, I don't have anything on. If I did have something like a breastplate, for example, on or equipped, let's say that breastplate gives me 100 HP. Then if I distribute a point to the percent armor HP, that would increase by 4%. 4% 4 of 100 is 4. So then I would get 104 HP added to my HP instead of just the, um, the base 100 that the armor gives regardless. No armor, because I just started the game, right? When it comes to strength, this is increasing your elemental mastery, melee mastery, distance mastery, and your health points. So right now I have 190 health points. If I distributed a point here, I would go to, what, 210? Yeah. Then with distance mastery, it even has a breakdown on the left in the little pop-up when you hover over that uh, field. Distance mastery is added to elemental mastery to increase damage dealt to targets that are three cells or more from the attacker. So it doesn't matter what kind of attack you do. What matters is how far away from your target you are. Melee mastery is two cells or less from the attacker. So if you're up close, melee. If you're far away, obviously that, you know, distance it stands to reason. And then for elemental mastery, that just increases the damage that your spells, um, that your spells do on enemies. Now, with regard to agility, lock... Lock increases your ability to keep an adversary in close combat. This characteristic is counterbalanced by your adversary's dodge. So essentially, if, you're, if your character is a melee fighter, then it would stand to reason that you want to keep your enemies close. Because if they get too far from you, you can't attack them. All of your attacks are close range. So you would want to increase your lock so that other characters can't, evade you so easily so if you have 10 lock and your attacker has zero dodge that character is going to have a hard time getting away from you so that's what it means by this characteristic is counterbalanced by your adversary's dodge keep in mind that attributing a point to this section only has to do with your lock it doesn't have anything to do with another character's lock if you want to make sure that you can get away from another character, that's when you look at dodge and you would want to put your points there or at least more of your points there. So me personally, um, because I tend to be a more distance kind of fighter um, and I like to play as characters with at least minimal healing abilities, I will never put anything in lock. Dodge is the opposite of lock, as already um, alluded to, right? Dodge increases your ability to distance yourself from an adjacent enemy. This characteristic is counterbalanced by your adversary's lock. Just like with the, um, with the intelligence and strength sections, it will show you where you're at now. And at your next level, if you add a point, what, what the change would look like initiative is something beneficial to put your points in because this um, basically allows for you to take your turn sooner in a turn-based role-playing game 
that is beneficial. Um, so the drop down or the little pop up, whatever you want to call it, says the first fighter to play is the one from the team with the highest initiative. Fighters then join in from one team, then the other in order of initiative from highest to lowest. Summons play right after their summoner. So if you have the highest initiative, right? For example, my main character is a Sadita. And Sadita's, um, one of their abilities is uh, to be able to summon dolls, right? And these dolls can attack, heal, and do other things. With this particular spell, right? Um, if I am the, if I have the highest initiative of everybody on the board, once everyone, once the placement phase is done and the fight begins, then I would go first, then each of my dolls would have their turn, and after my dolls, whoever has the second highest initiative would go. That's what that means. So for lock and dodge, this is a way to increase both at the same time. That's for characters who happen to be um, a little bit of both. Some characters can switch their states from being um, a long distance to a short range fighter. Like depending on what state is what the what their range for each spell is. And so it might benefit them to increase lock and dodge at the same time rather than one or the other. I usually only just increase my dodge. Um, force of will increases your ability to remove action points and movement points, as well as your resistance to action points and movement point loss. So some enemies... Oh, hold on. I have a... This knee's coming up. I muted myself, but sorry about that. Um, if the mute didn't work, I won't know until I review these videos. But anyway, not the point. The point is that when it comes to force of will, there are some enemies that their attack will take away an action point from you. Or will take away a movement point from you. So let's say your character has three movement points, meaning that they can move three squares every turn. And something attacks you that takes away a movement point, now you can only move two squares every turn for that fight. But if your force of will is high enough, they can try and do that attack on you to take away a movement point, and it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. When both players have the exact same number of force of will, it's assumed that there's a 50-50 chance that the AP will be removed, let's say, if I cast an AP removal spell on, on my attacker, right? If we have the same force of will, 50-50 chance that it's going to work. Um, it's basically on a, a roll of the dice when it comes to force of will. I don't know the exact numbers, but basically if one player has more force of will than the other, then the odds will, you know, ever be in their favor. So that would be the benefit of putting a point in this area under agility. <clears throat> then when it comes to fortune, this is, this is, I mean, as the section indicates, increases your chances of, um, you know, landing a critical hit, of blocking an attack, of, um, and of, and of some other things that I'm not seeing here. For some reason, I thought this list was had more stuff. Maybe I'm just misremembering. Or I'm thinking of something else. I might be thinking of something else. I don't know. Not the point. The point is, is that I'm going to go ahead and read through this. Uh, for percent critical hit. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Each critical hit point increases your chances of landing a critical hit by 1%. Critical hits increase damage by 25%. So, and then depending on where you are with regard to your target, it can do even more damage, right? Because from the side and from behind does increase damage. Percent block 
that, you know, each block point makes you 1% more likely to reduce damage received by 20%. For example, if your attacker hits you with the spell that would normally take away 50 HP, right, and you've increased your percent block to 20%, that would be 10 HP that you were able to block. So instead of taking away 50 HP, that attack would only, you would only receive 40 HP in, in damage. Hopefully that makes sense. Critical Mastery is added to Elemental Mastery to increase damage dealt from critical hits. Rear Mastery is added to Elemental Mastery to increase damage when attacking a target from behind. So both of them increase Elemental Mastery. Berserk Mastery, this is for characters like, like the Uganok, for example, who has like a Berserk mode, right? Um, berserk Mastery is added to Elemental Mastery to increase damage inflicted when you have less than 50% of your max health. So your character's about to die. Now all of their attacks are stronger than normal because, you know, your character isn't about to go down without a fight. They're going to go down swinging, right? So um, when you increase Berserk Mastery, that increases your uh, how much damage you deal out. For rear resistance, that reduces the damage from attacks that are suffered from behind. And critical resistance reduces the damage you suffer from critical attacks. Keep in mind that the difference between uh, critical hit mastery and berserk mastery is that berserk only applies if the character's HP is below 50%. So if you have a character that's always in the thick of it, then you might want to consider the Berserk. Like if you have a Uganok or um, a Sacrier, then you would benefit from, from this particular option. But some characters don't even have a Berserk mode, so it's not even worth it to put any points here. With the Major, a lot of the times you're not going to get any points here until you've hit like um, a milestone, right? So level 20 level 35, level 60, no, 20, 35, 50, 65, 80, and 100 are the milestones so far that I know of, because I've got, I've gotten to level 100 on my main. Um, other milestones I'm not sure of because I haven't gotten there yet, but once you've hit this milestone, you will have a point to distribute into any of these sections. So you could do elemental resistance, percent damage inflicted. Um, these are things that you can kind of get from other stuff. So I don't really see the point, but it depends on your character as well. Um, for example, the Sedita doesn't really do too much damage. So it actually would benefit to put a point here in percent damage inflicted if you happen to have a Sedita character just so they're not as weak, right? Because um, the Sedita is more of a healer than a fighter. So um, control and damage, uh, this has to do with characters that are able to um, basically like move other characters. So I didn't explain it very well the last time. Long story short, this increases how many characters you can control at one time for some characters. And increases damage as well. Like some of these things... For example, the action point gives you one action point, right? The movement point gives you one movement point and 20 elemental mastery. So you're getting an increase in movement points and damage. Then there's one for range and damage, right? One range, 40 elemental mastery. For wakfu points, two wakfu points or 150 QB. Not 100% sure what QB is. Haven't really come across that too much in the game yet. So I would refer to Google for QB. I have now pressed the Google button on the internet machine and QB is Quadramental Breeze. All of the Hopper Mage's elemental spells generate Quadramental Breeze. This is used by light spells, which are the most powerful. So the Hopper Mage 
is one of the 18 classes you can plate. And in just a minute, I am basically going to say something that this has just confirmed is correct. I want to say that has to do with like magics, like like specific specific spells, the spells that are specific to a class. That's that's what I believe that is. Uh, Kartivasar has invited you to join the Gil Rivendell. Do you want to accept the invitation? No. So sorry. Um, guilds, worth it to join. But we'll, we're not going to go into that right now. Um, I'm pretty sure I explained everything in the characteristics. You know what? Let's go ahead and go into guilds right now. Because I haven't moved an inch in the last like 20 minutes. So let's explain some other shit. So whenever you go to community, which are the two little characters together um, on the button... When you hover over, it'll say community. But you will have this guild option. It looks like a badge, basically. But um, right now it says you're not currently a member of a guild. Because I'm not. This character is not in a guild. But once you're able to join a guild, that's one way, if you're playing on the single player server, that you can interact with other players. Um, and get help. Because some of these dungeons, you really... Unless you're higher level, much higher level than the dungeon's, you know, recommended level, you're probably going to need at least one other player to get through it. You know what I'm saying? So, it's worth it to join a guild if you can. The sooner the better, to be honest. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop here and pick up the hero potential quest in the next clip.